So for our last week, hopefully not too much to do. Um, for reading uh, our last chapter in the book, The Recent Past, which covers, I think, roughly from like 1989 to 2019. So it's a, it's a lot sort of crammed in there. For the purposes of the exam, I would say focus. You don't have to worry too much about anything after about 2000 with respect to the exam. Um, with respect to being a well-rounded and thoughtful citizen, you know, read it all, hopefully understand it, but um, the questions that are on the, ex on the exam, I know a lot of you are starting, you know, heading into review and exam mode. Don't stress too much about the really recent things. We're not gonna get into that too much. There's also the online activity. The there are a couple citizens archives projects. Um, take a look. When I planned this back in March, there was actually a lot of transcription left to be done. That is not the case anymore. Millions of people home uh, means that many of them are looking for things to do and some of them have found uh, citizen transcription projects. So I think most of these are done. Uh, but I would still like you just to take a look at the websites and what, the, what these projects are and, and how ordinary, how you know, sort of crowdsourcing uh, history has become um, one sort of popular and, and, and helpful way to get information out there. So just learn a little bit about the projects themselves and do your best to answer the questions. That's all I'm gonna ask on that one. I just want you to be aware that this exists, that there is sort of this technology angle on, the, on how history is being reported now. We have our fifth forum. Um, those questions which can be reflective on the text um, or also the semester um, as a whole. Um, you can talk about uh, sort of big themes, you can talk about specifics in the text. Um, also feel free to, you know, think and ask and reflect about the experience of uh, having this weird hybrid semester because of a global pandemic, um, or reflect on our current situation. It's, it's a much more sort of open, um, approach to wrap up everything. Um, and this week's questions from Ann Mills, Bruce, Ellie, Jacob, Luke, Olivia, and Shelby. Again, our final exam review will have a Zoom session uh, to review questions uh, Wednesday from 1030 to 1130. Um, and then extra credit for this week. A couple of these, uh, so Boys in the Hood and The Truman Show, I haven't found streaming. If you can find them or have them, um, you are more, you are, you're very, very welcome to take a look uh, or, or to watch them or if you know them. Um, Boys in the Hood uh, talks about sort of a, it's a coming of age story um, set in South Central LA uh, in the late 80s, early 90s um, when uh, gang culture and gang violence uh, starts to really take hold there. Uh, the Truman Show is kind of an interesting, um, particularly now, even though the film is from 1998, um, when we're just barely beginning sort of the reality show era. Um, so it's about a man whose entire life, unbeknownst to him, is a TV show. Um, and is is very public. So it sort of pre-stages, you know, sort of the the dilemmas of, of like reality TV. Um, also in the age of social media, it's, um, it's really interesting to, to look back. It sort of says a lot about, you know, how life is curated or projected to other people, which many of us do on our social media accounts. It's a very sort of visible and curated life. Uh, other, other options for this week, uh, the film Philadelphia. Um, which is on Netflix. Uh, Philadelphia, it looks at um, the fictional, although inspired by some real event story of um, uh, a lawyer with, uh, who's HIV positive and, and develops AIDS. Um, he's fired from his job because of his status and his sexual orientation um, and his uh, sort of uh, Quest to sort of pitch that as a, a wrongful termination and ultimately a civil rights uh, kind of lawsuit. Uh, the, 19, the 2016 film Hell or High Water on Netflix, which is a neo-Western, 
um, but really reflects on some of the economic anxiety of the early 21st century um, and animosity towards banks. So uh, you have some modern bank robbing um, and uh, you know reflections on the instability a lot of people were feeling after the 2008 uh, economic crash or uh, crisis. Uh, and finally, the report on Amazon Prime, which is a fictionalized retelling of um, the investigation to create the torture report, uh, which highlighted the abuses of uh, American interrogators uh, during the war on terror. Um, so using what most, uh, you know, most of us um, would pretty clearly consider torture and, and why that happened. And then lastly, we do have a podcast that was sort of part of our, um, sort of part of the old syllabus as well. Um, so any episode from season three of Serial on the criminal justice system, uh, had we still been in classes, one of the, the books we were gonna read at the end of the semester uh, was Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, uh, which is a wonderful book. I, you know, if, you, if you have it with you, or you will eventually get it out of your dorm when you can go back to campus. Um, I really do recommend you read it. It's, it's very well written. It's a really important book. And, but, uh, and this, the season three of Serial actually dovetails really nicely with some of the themes in it. So you can get a little bit of a sense of the kind of questions they're gonna ask by, by looking at those episodes. And finally, some nuts and bolts for the final exam. I think I made a one typo on the review sheet, um, but you can complete the exam during any three hour block of time between 9 a.m. this Friday and 11.59 p.m., so midnight, um, uh, Monday, May 4th. Um, for those of you with extra time, that three hour block becomes a four and a half hour block. As with the midterm, just write your beginning and end time on the, on the paper itself or on the document itself. Like the midterm, you can use your notes uh, and class material. Please do not look anything else up. Like the midterm, it will be a choice of two essay questions. Each question has three documents you need to use, and the questions will assess your ability to analyze documents and discuss major themes in U.S. history over time. Um, so essentially, hopefully, um, nothing should be too um, unusual. Uh, this really will be uh, just like uh, just like the midterm. The the point value is the same, so the format's the same, and the expectations are the same. Technically, you have a lot more time, um, but I don't think it's. I know personally because I have the point values the same. I don't think it's fair to expect like more. Um, from the final exam. So this should hopefully not be something that's too um, intense or stressful. And then you can just uh, resubmit those on Google Classroom as a Word document, um, Google Doc, or, or PDF. Okay, well, then we're gonna head into lecture for today. But first, um, if everyone can go to the chat function, since we are in the recent past, um, just to get a sense of, you know, where our own experiences overlap with history. I'd like everyone just to take a couple minutes and type into the chat function um, the first thing that you personally remember that was deemed historic, the first event that you lived, historic event that you lived through. Okay, so we've got a lot of Hurricane Katrina's, 2008 election, Iraq War, yep, that's come up before. So yeah, we have a, a bunch of, a lot of similarities, um, which is to be expected. Most of you are on the same age. Um, and, you know, we have these idea, the idea of these sort of big events um, that take place as, as making history. And sometimes that's the case and, and, and sometimes not. But I, I just want to uh, acknowledge that as we get into this final chapter, we're starting to um, hit events that you might remember that certainly your parents probably remember. Um, and the, the writers of this book sort of remember as foundational and formative events in their own uh, lives. So that's really part of how we're going to shape and structure uh, 
class going forward. Um, and how these how particularly how big of also how big events sort of shape the way um, uh, the lenses that we're going to use to look at history. So this chapter takes us from the end of the Cold War, um, which is sort of one way of thinking about how life, how foreign policy, domestic policy worked in the United States. Everything was through a Cold War lens that ends by 1991. Um, and sort of from that time period on, there's been this uh, sort of search for a new clear framework. And for a while, um, that was the war on terror. I think that's changed a little bit now, um, but we'll see that sort of um, shifting going on in this chapter. All right, um, so I do want to start by just briefly noting um, the changes going on in the Soviet Union uh, to bring about, uh, to bring up the, this, the end of the Cold War, and I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Um, uh, but just, you know, at least we think that uh, U.S. spending was the main, uh, <clears throat> or the arms race brought the Soviet Union to its knees and the United States won the Cold War alone. Uh, a lot is going on in Eastern Europe that many Americans were sort of unaware of until the Soviet Union broke apart. Um, so these events happening behind the so-called Iron Curtain. Uh, life was becoming increasingly difficult in the USSR and Eastern Bloc uh, by the 1980s, uh, socially, economically, socially, and politically. Uh, economic overextension and inefficiencies in manufacturing led to shortages, which could not be mitigated by international trade. Um, because the sort of the ideal that the system was trying to do was have an, a completely internal economy, which was not working. Um, this was especially bad between 1964 and 1982, and again in the late 1980s. There were human and environmental disasters, um, like the Chernobyl explosion in 1986, um, which was followed up by outrage of cover-ups about the severity of of the explosion. The military was stretched too thin um, during this period, not to oversimplify or make false comparisons, but you can in some ways think about the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the 1980s as the Soviet Union's Vietnam. Um, it was longer than expected, um, bloodier than expected, um, and you know, it's a case where there were troops who didn't entirely understand why they were there um, and who were not coming home to a particularly supportive um, uh, home country. Meanwhile, democratic movements uh, were going on in many of the Warsaw Pact countries um, and independence movements in parts of the Soviet Union itself, um, particularly in, in the Balkan uh, or the Baltic states, excuse me. And also the emergence of uh, subcultures, including punk and goth, that were sort of challenging uh, establishment ideals. During this period, uh, the general secretary of the Communist Party and then president of the Soviet Union was Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, he inherited a stagnant economy and a bloated bureaucracy. Uh, and found himself in a particularly difficult position. Ultimately, he had pushback from hardliners in his own party um, on the one hand and liberalizers uh, on, on the other hand who wanted to do away with the single party system altogether, um, which put him ultimately in an unstable position and ultimately um, uh, his, his uh, leaving power. He's best know, known for his twin policies of glasnost or openness to extend personal freedoms and perestroika or restructuring, which democratized so the Soviet political process, allowing for some free market reforms and freer elections. Uh, he also withdrew troops from Afghanistan and signed an arms treaty with Reagan in 1987. <clears throat> Despite, despite these changes, um, or perhaps uh, because of them, there was a desire to push them further. Um, and that started to happen in some ways all at once, um, particularly to observers in the West. 
um, it felt that suddenly things were happening. Uh, a non-communist prime minister in Poland, uh, as a result of the Solidarity Movement, uh, Hungary, revolutions in Romania and Czechoslovakia, the Berlin Wall came down in 1989 and Germany was reunified a year later. Um, free elections in Bulgaria in 1990, the Warsaw Pact dissolved in 1991, um, and Yugoslavia um, fell apart in uh, 1992, which in turn sparked a civil war and genocide. Um, so not all of this um, change was unambiguously positive or, or peaceful. Uh, some of it was quite violent. <clears throat> you also see the breakup of the Soviet Union itself. Um, so all the countries that are in green uh, before 1991 were one country. So that you had different Soviet socialist republics within the Soviet Union that acted semi-autonomously. Um, but were part of the same country, some of which um, were added, uh, like uh, Ukraine, um, or parts of Ukraine, most of Ukraine, um, in the early 20th century, other areas like parts of Central Asia, which have been conquered and colonized um, by the Russian imperial state earlier on. But essentially, in 1991, you have the, United, the USSR breaks into 15 different countries. Meanwhile, uh, this was all sort of just being watched uh, by the United States. Uh, and to many, it seemed like communism itself uh, just fell apart. Others felt that American actions had won the Cold War um, and unambiguously showed that the, the United States had it right, that capitalism was uh, the correct um, way to go about things, that this has been a great victory. And some even uh, referred to uh, this as the end of history. So Francis Fukuyama wrote an essay called The End of History to describe the end of the Cold War system as an unabashed victory of economic and political liberalism. And when we mean um, by the end of history, we mean sort of a sense that there, there is no longer an existential uh, battle between different worldviews that things are just going to kind of go forward the same way. Uh, this led to a lot of optimism, um, but it was also unclear what the national mission was going to be. Um, what did it mean to be in a one superpower world? Um, so despite the end of the Cold War, um, uh, you still have uh, a, a, a lot of, um, you have a lot of uncertainty and uh, unclear or um, at times inconsistent uh, foreign policies. So the United States uh, got involved in uh, Kuwait in the Gulf War, as we'll see in a minute, um, and encouraged uh, intervention in uh, Yugoslavia or the former Yugoslavia, um, but uh, not in uh, Rwanda, for example, in 1994. Um, so you see this, this struggle to figure out where interventions happen and, and what the, the role of the United States is going to be going forward. Um, so during the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War happened uh, under the watch of President George H.W. Bush. Um, although, uh, particularly among many conservatives, Reagan is really seen as the ultimate Cold Warrior who won the war. Cold War, uh, this is, this, it really happened with Bush. Um, he was Reagan's vice president for both terms. Before that, he was in Congress and director of the CIA. Um, so un, unsurprisingly, Bush was a, uh, was, you know, largely focused on uh, foreign policy. Those are really his strengths. So in some ways, it's a continuation of the conservative swing. He won pretty handily in uh, 1988. Um, but on the other hand, he's not, he would, you know, he didn't quite fit with uh, parts of that new right coalition, particularly the religious right. He was never really comfortable with them uh, and he was never really seen as one of them. Um, very different from his son, George W. Bush, who had pretty, has pretty strong 
uh, you know, honest evangelical uh, credentials. So came off as much more of a, a moral conservative than his dad. Uh, and under Bush, we have the first Gulf War uh, or Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Uh, so in 1990, Iraq, under the leadership of Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party, invaded its, its small neighbor, Kuwait, um, and took over the Kuwaiti oil fields. Uh, the U.S. planned to intervene if Iraq did not withdraw troops uh, for, for end of January 1991. Um, and this is a particularly tense moment. It's the first time that there's really an American troop deployment after Vietnam. Um, so there's a lot of concern that that's the context that we need to sort of understand a lot of this first Gulf War in that it um, It is designed to be the anti-Vietnam. It was a limited and clear mission to get Iraq out of Kuwait to ensure Kuwaiti independence. Bush went to clearly went to Congress um, for those particular permissions. You know, force was was considered sort of quick and overwhelming. However, something else that's really important um, is the role of the media. So we've talked about media in, in war a couple of times already um, with respect to World War II and the propaganda films we watched, again with Vietnam and uh, journalists on the ground and nightly television coverage. By 1991, we have jumped yet again in media's relationship uh, with the military as we enter the era of 24-hour news, cable news, and uh, widespread foreign correspondence uh, of CNN. So we've got about a four-minute clip. Um, so I'm going to actually let Wolf Blitzer take over and explain a little bit of what was uh, happening uh, in his first year working at CNN, 1990-1991. Uh, and I want you to pay attention to things that might seem both similar or different to the media's relationship with the military from Vietnam. My first day at CNN was May 8th, 1990. And U.S. officials have an added terrorist threat to worry about. I was a military affairs correspondent for CNN, uh, and I thought it was going to be a relatively quiet beat. This Cold War was winding down. But then all of a sudden, on August 1st, a few weeks later, 1990, Saddam Hussein stuns the world and invades Kuwait. And uh, it became a huge story. The U.S. obviously got involved very quickly. This will not stand, this aggression against uh, Kuwait. This was the first real war that uh, we had cameras on the scene. Here we had live satellite coverage of all the key locations, and people could watch a war unfold live. At that time, we were the only 24-7 cable news network. I'm pleased to report that we can go back to Baghdad now and our three correspondents there. Let's see who picks up the phone. This, this is Peter on that. He were just temporarily off the air. I remember very vividly, uh, I was at the Pentagon uh, covering the war. The air war was starting and the Iraqis responded by launching Scud missiles against targets in Saudi Arabia where the U.S. had deployed thousands and thousands of troops. I remember they started launching Scud missiles at various targets in Israel. I am told that the uh, U.S. and other allied uh, air forces are uh, revisiting many of the original targets, making sure they were completely put out of uh, commission. And so I checked with my sources at the Pentagon, and they told me exactly where that Scud landed. And we'll be, as, as the Secretary said, we're going to be as forthcoming as we possibly can. And, all at and, the same uh, innocently, I went on the air and reported that. Well, all hell broke out. Generals were calling me, top Pentagon officials, what are you doing, Wolf? And I, I was confused. I didn't know why they were so upset. They said, you're spotting for Saddam Hussein. You're telling them precisely, and they're watching you live on CNN right now, you're telling them where that missile landed. And so that was the last time we or any other television news organization basically specifically said where these scuds were landing. And it underscored this new powerful dimension, live war coverage, Innocent reporters could inadvertently provide information that could result in the deaths and the destruction of a lot of people, so you didn't want to do that. After several weeks of pounding from the air, and they were knocking Iraqi targets in Kuwait and elsewhere in Iraq, at that point they realized, you know what, you can't just do it from the air, you got to send ground troops in. Just to explain to our viewers why you did not hear from us for 
uh, a nervously long time. For the past 20 minutes, I've been hiding under a table, and uh, what happened was the security people made a sweep. They got very upset that uh, there were three mortal... Everybody else, all the other news organizations, pulled out of Baghdad because they were afraid uh, that the war was going to start. Uh, and these, these courageous CNN journalists, they stayed there. All the flying shells and falling bullets made us glad we brought our helmets with us from the battlefield. So it really did put CNN on the map as a, as a global news organization, and people were, were glued to their TVs during those days. The U.S. stopped at the end of February 1991 and didn't go and try to destroy uh, Saddam Hussein's regime or take over Iraq or get rid of Saddam Hussein. This was a limited operation that President Bush uh, had authorized, liberate Kuwait and then stop. And that's exactly what they did. This war is now behind us. Ahead of us is the difficult task of securing a potentially historic peace. I was extremely proud uh, that I was a member of that CNN team that covered that first Gulf War. Here at the Pentagon, we are broadcasting now from the CNN office at the Pentagon. I think we really did it in a responsible way. Uh, we really did it thoroughly, and it really did change CNN. The image of CNN put us on the map to this day. 25 years later, I walk around here in the United States or indeed around the world. People always come up to me, oh, I remember the Gulf War, I remember what you were doing. As we and other networks have been reporting now for months, the United States was going to take those missile sites out. No one and it's a source of pride to me that, you know, I quote, became famous covering that war. I worked really hard, but uh, we did a good job. Um, so briefly, what are some things in the video that, that stood out to you as, um, as important about the way the media covered the Gulf War, either similarly or differently from Vietnam? Yeah, so the coverage was, was live. They could just satellite um, information, either from phone calls or actually sending video more quickly. Um, it was also around the clock, so it wouldn't all be sort of edited and condensed for a, a nightly news uh, segment at the end of the day. Anything else? Or why that might be important? Yeah, so you have this sort of new relationship where, uh, you know, because of that, that constant stream, and not just is it live and constant, but it's CNN, it's cable, um, and sort of from its inception, it was designed to also be a, a global uh, news outlet. So. Um, yeah, that particular story about like, you know, you know what, Saddam Hussein has CNN. Um, he and his generals can watch this too. So be careful, you know, having that, um, need, you know, need to be, be sort of careful about what's, um, what's reported as, is sort of emphasized in this, this world. Anything else? Well, yeah, so again, this is really sort of a change again, in the way that the media works with major events, particularly you know, international events, military events. Um, and this kind of back and forth and you know, real time demonstration of, of violence uh, starts to become normal in, in the 1990s and, and, and early 2000s with the, the rise of cable news. Um, you know, CNN was, was there for the Gulf War, they were, they were there again um, in, in Kosovo uh, a little bit later in the 90s um, in, in, in the Balkans uh, and of course um, with the war on terror um, st starting in 2001 uh, that was those were conflicts that were um, you know constantly on television um, and in real time um, one of you know my uh, really sort of clear news watching memories you know, some, somewhere when I was in middle school uh, was the bombings uh, involved with the in, uh, invasion of Iraq, finding out that we were invading Iraq by turning on the TV and seeing the shock and awe campaign and just watching bombs uh, drop on Baghdad and, and uh, military targets and, and, you know, again, sort of seeing that live. Um, is a really kind of, I mean, I think we're used to a lot of instant information, but it's still very surreal to watch war uh, live, at least I, I felt that way. 
Um, so yeah, so we have this, this different kind of information. Now one would think, might think after um, successfully ending a, a contained war that Bush would have been in a good position for re-election. Uh, however, as noted on the campaign room, campaign war room of Bill Clinton, it's the economy, stupid. And uh, the Gulf War uh, coincided and was followed by a pretty bad recession, uh, really set in in 1991, uh, leading Bush to break actually one of his campaign promises by raising taxes to try to cope with it. He was never popular, of course, with the right wing of his party, and he faced a primary contest um, from uh, Pat Buchanan. He won the primary, but you lose, as a sitting president, typically you tend to lose a lot of political power if you are um, challenged by someone in your own party. It sort of marks that you're not, you don't have the confidence of your own uh, constituents. This was leveraged by a young governor from Arkansas, Bill Clinton, uh, who used the you know, poor economy, uh, as well as pursuing sort of a centrist platform for the 1992 presidential campaign. Um, so taking some ideas that might have typically been Republican and moderating them to sort of fit this sort of middle ground. So it was really a campaign aimed at uh, getting moderate voters from both parties uh, and undecided voters, and it worked. Um, Clinton was also a baby boomer, uh, so he also so also sort of used his his age uh, as a young person, uh, youngish person running for president. Um, he did things that previous presidential candidates would have, you know, never really thought to have done or considered doing, like appearing on MTV and playing his saxophone on Arsenio Hall. Um, you know, getting really getting that um, <clears throat> a sense of, you know, this is somebody who's like, like you. Um, and really a, a strong contrast from the much older, um, <clears throat> uh, aristocratic uh, George H.W. Bush. I'm just gonna show a short clip here as well. It's about, it's a little under two minutes um, where we can see this contrast and, and particularly see Clinton in a debate, in a town hall debate, using that idea of, you know, the economy, but also uh, his ability to connect um, with individual voters. Um, as a speaker, Clinton was really notable at, uh, at this time because he's able to um, speak like a, no a normal person without coming off like he's speaking down uh, to voters. And that's why I'm trying to do something about it, by stimulating the export, investing more, better education systems. Thank Governor you. I'm Clinton. glad to clarify. Tell me how it's affected you again. Um, you know people who've lost their well, jobs, yeah. lost their homes. Uh -huh. Well, I've been governor of a small state for 12 years. I'll tell you how it's affected me. Every year, Congress and the President sign laws that makes us, make us do more things, it gives us less money to do it with. I see people in my state, middle class people, their taxes have gone up in Washington and their services have gone down, while the wealthy have gotten tax cuts. I, I have seen what's happened in this last four years when, in my state, when people lose their jobs, there's a good chance I'll know them by their names. When a factory closes, I know the people who ran it. When the businesses go bankrupt, I know them. And I've been out here for 13 months, meeting in meetings just like this, ever since October, with people like you all over America. People that have lost their jobs, lost their livelihood, lost their health insurance. Mm -hmm. What I want you to understand is the national debt is not the only cause of that. It is because America has not invested in its people. It is because we have not grown. It is because we've had 12 years of trickle-down economics. We've gone from first to 12th in the world in wages. We've had four years where we produced no private sector jobs. Most people are working harder for less money than they were making 10 years ago. It is because we are in the grip of a failed economic theory. And this decision you're about to make better be about what kind of economic theory you want. Not just people saying, I want to go fix it, but what are we going to do? What I think we have to do is invest in American jobs, American education, control American health care costs, and bring the American people together again. 
All right, so again, in that short clip, we can sort of see him make this uh, sort of transition from the personal uh, to the political theory. And that ended up being really persuasive to many people uh, in 1992. Uh, so what Clinton was doing was creating this idea that sometimes referred to as the third way, um, a different kind, he was a different kind of, of, of democratic nominee who's not just sort of relying on the tradition of the New Deal or the Great Society, uh, but uh, again, this sort of moderating idea, so supporting uh, free, uh, free trade uh, through NAFTA, uh, welfare reform, which often meant uh, more restrictions on uh, entitlement programs, things like work requirements for some programs, which he was later criticized for, deregulation of, of the economy while also having economic stimulus programs, compromising and working with people, uh, with uh, Republicans, and then in, in blue, because it's the one that really definitely didn't happen, uh, universal health care. So we can also see in that short clip a, a, a new political discussion around health care. So it's during the 1990s, uh, late 80s, and, and uh, expanding and continuing to be a major problem throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, um, high numbers of people who are uninsured and higher uh, medical costs. Um, so when things like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security were put in, the concern was that the elderly, so people who were on fixed incomes, um, and poor people um, were unable to afford health care. Uh, by the 1990s, health care, if not unaffordable, was starting to become a major uh, household expense for most Americans, um, either purchasing, either having to purchase insurance, paying for health care uninsured, or increasing um, premiums and deductibles on uh, their employer provided insurance. So we start to see this become a big uh, conversation piece. Clinton, by the way, was impeached. Um, like every other president so far who has been impeached, he was acquitted. <clears throat> and it was you know, pretty much a, a party line vote on that. Leading into 1998 midterms, some wanted to undercut, and the right one to undercut Clinton's popularity. Um, so there are various investigations into uh, business dealings of both uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton, and also investigations into Clinton's, uh, Bill Clinton's sexual history. First, um, Paula Jones, who a former employee who sued him for sexual harassment, um, and then uh, most closely tied to the impeachment, uh, Monica, his uh, sexual relationship with Monica Lewinsky, uh, a former White House intern. Uh, Clinton denied having sexual relations, um, which, uh, you know, detractors claimed he said it under oath, um, which was claimed to be perjury, therefore an impeachable offense. Uh, Clinton said he didn't lie and just had a apparently very narrow definition of what sexual relations means. You can look up the details yourself on that one, but the sort of the important thing is, A, the sort of impeachment and acquittal. Um, and also in the context of more recent events, it, it's, it's also worth noting that this went very differently than we might imagine something like this happening now. The idea, it, it rarely came up, for example, that uh, Lewinsky had been a you know, college intern and he had been the president. Um, or we might see this now as a major sort of Me Too moment, that was pretty much uh, ignored. And uh, she was seen as being sort of having equal control in this relationship, um, which, you know, definitionally we might, we would now say is, is just not possible. Um, but also sort of a note there um, <clears throat> of how things have changed in the last uh, 20 years. Very quickly to wrap up, 2000 election, uh, Al Gore distancing himself from his president uh, in light of the impeachment can scandal, um, but largely sort of following the same kind of moderate Democrat um, principles against George W. Bush, who was governor of Texas, um, son of a president, um, and really represented that new coalition of the right from the 1980s. Once again, we have an American election where the person who becomes president does not win the popular vote. It came down to a recount in Florida to decide the electoral vote. Um, 
and a Supreme Court case to confirm um, the decision of the governor of Florida, Jeb Bush, um, who declared the election for his brother, George. All of this, which was a big deal, was very quickly overshadowed by something far more uh, impactful and frightening, uh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks on New York and Washington, which fundamentally turned attention away from domestic policy and focused on the new war on terror, um, creating a paradigm, paradigm analogous to the Cold War uh, and its power to shape international narratives. It's, it's you're with us or you're with the terrorists and shaped uh, a lot of what happened going forward. And finally, to, to do a very a, a jump cut uh, to 2008, before we leave, I do want to note, leave us a sort of on this uh, 2008 note of uh, challenges to that, that paradigm um, with the election of Barack Obama in 2008. So by 2008, Democrats in particular were ready for a candidate opposed to the escalation of the war on terror, um, particularly as some of its successes came out, um, an invasion of Iraq um, with sort of false information about weapons of mass destruction um, and uh, highlights of, of abuses um, of suspected prisoners in Abu Ghraib uh, in Iraq as well. Uh, furthermore, once again, the economy has something to do with this. Uh, so a housing bubble burst in late 2007 um, after mortgage lending practices that were um, very questionable in hindsight. Uh, started a chain reaction that collapsed the global economy. Um, so Obama ended up running on promises of hope and change, uh, marking a return in some ways to sort of New Deal and great society ambitions of Democrats, of not necessarily just walking a middle ground, but doubling down and saying, no, we believe in stimulus and big projects, uh, universal health care, which was attempted again, um, as well as um, uh, uh, um, the changing, uh, changing opportunities, broadening opportunities for more Americans. Um, also, as a young African-American senator, I know none of these presidents seem young to you, but trust me, 40-something-year-old presidents are young. Um, uh, so as a young senator, he, uh, he seemed to embody uh, the change of the 20th century and the future of the 21st century. Um, and his energy and policies um, and person particularly appealed to uh, young millennial voters the, who at that point were the, the most uh, diverse and socially uh, liberal generation um, in recent uh, American history. For many of whom 2008, um, including this millennial, um, this was their first presidential election. All right, so we're about five minutes over and I will stop there. Um, thank you all again so, so much uh, for being here, for working through this really bizarre time. And thank you for being one of, uh, as I mentioned, those of you who are here at the beginning, I am actually moving on to a permanent position elsewhere next year. Um, so this is my, you're one of my last uh, Sewanee classes and I just wanna say that you've been great. Um, and if I don't see you in the review session, uh, have a, a wonderful summer uh, and next year, and I hope you all stay uh, safe and healthy. So thank you everyone. <laughs>